So this problem is from the 2015 AP Calc AB exam. Uh, it's a non-calculator question. This is pretty typical of a lot of non-calculator questions that you're going to encounter. They provide you with a graph of f prime. So have to make sure we recognize this is f prime. It's not f. It's going to be tempting to, to use logic about f to answer some of these pieces as we make our way through this, but definitely f prime throughout the four pieces of this. Uh, that's what they tell us in the first sentence, right? So yeah, we've got a graph of f prime. Two derivatives exist for the function f, right? So we've got the derivative existing that they provide us with the graph of, and then the second derivative also always exists, but we don't see the graph of that one. Uh, the graph of f prime has horizontal tangents, negative 1, 1, and 3. And then the areas between the x-axis and f prime, from negative 2 to 1, we have 9 square units. And then from 1 to 4, we've got 12 square units. What they ask us to do in part A is they ask us to find all of the x values where we have a maximum. Now that's on f, right? That's not on f prime. So, and then as always, give a reason for your answer. So anytime you're trying to identify where you have a relative max, you've probably built that conclusion by using a sign chart. And it's a sign chart for f prime, right? If f prime is positive, the slope of your function is positive and your graph is increasing. And if f prime is negative, the slope of your function is negative and f prime and f is decreasing anywhere where that happens. And when we see a change from positive to negative with the sign of f prime, that does indicate we have a max. So I've obviously already got the sign chart built here. Uh, and that does indicate that we have a maximum at negative 2. So here's my conclusion and my uh, justifying statement. My sine of f prime changes from positive to negative at that x. That's why I have a maximum there. But why does the sine chart look like this? This is actually a pretty easy sine chart to build. This is a graph of f prime, right? So you need to know when f prime has the opportunity to change signs. Well, it has the opportunity to change signs if it's first equal to 0. That happens at negative 2. That happens at 1, and we don't have to consider anything to the other side of 4. If this graph extended further, we'd have to consider uh, 4 as a possible spot, too, where f prime could change signs because f prime is 0 there. We also need to know where f prime is undefined. This graph is always defined. There aren't any holes or asymptotes on this graph, so f prime is always defined. So we basically had two locations between negative 3 and 4 where f prime had the chance to change signs, negative 2 and 1. Sine of f prime here, y value of the graph there, positive. Sine of f prime here, y value of the graph there, negative. So we go positive, negative as we pass through negative 2. And then as we go through 1, we're negative to the left, but we're still negative on the other side. So sine chart's completed that way. You've got your conclusion that goes along with it. Part B, where is f? both concave down and decreasing. Now they do ask for open intervals, right? So they didn't want there to be any confusion as to whether or not you needed to include endpoints. An open interval is never going to include endpoints. So we want to know where two things are happening simultaneously, where our graph is concave down and where our graph is decreasing. So concavity has to do with the second derivative and our graph is concave down if the second derivative is less than zero, if the second derivative is negative. Our graph is decreasing if the first derivative is negative. So we basically need to know when f prime and f double prime are negative. So what I did is I, I kind of copied the sign chart from part A into this, right? Because this tells us where the function is decreasing. The function's decreasing anywhere where the derivative's negative, and that happens from negative 2 to 4. Uh, I also wanted to build a sign chart for f double prime, and then I had to compare the two and, and see where these two things were happening simultaneously. So I did have to realize what to look at to build my sign chart for f double prime. This is a graph of f prime. f double prime is the derivative of f prime. Anytime I'm looking at a graph and I'm trying to determine values of that graph's derivative, I'm always going to look at slopes. So I'm looking at the slope of this graph, negative, 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 zero. They told us we had a horizontal tangent at negative one, so zero for the slope here. Positive, 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 until we get to zero again at one. And then negative, 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 until we get to zero again at three. And then positive on the other side of three, the rest of the way to four. 
So if you look at what my sign chart for F double prime looks like, it, it basically goes through the same signs that we just talked through as we looked at the graph. We had negative slopes between negative 3 and negative 1, therefore a negative F double prime value. Uh, we had positive slopes between negative 1 and 1, so a positive F double prime value, and so on throughout the rest of the interval. So we're looking for when F prime is negative and F double prime is negative at the same time. So from negative 2 to 4, F prime is negative. From negative 2 to 1, F double prime is negative, so there's an open interval where both things are happening simultaneously. And then we're looking at a decreasing function, a negative value for F prime, clear up until we get to 4. So the only other time when F double prime is negative is from 1 to 3. And so here are the two open intervals where both of these things are happening simultaneously. And then I just, in my concluding statement there, the reasoning behind my answer, I made sure I, I said what I noted back here. I, I'm having these as my intervals because that's where the second derivative is negative and the first derivative is negative. Part C of this asks us to figure out where the function is going to have points of inflection. So points of inflection are any locations where our graph changes concavity. We basically already have in place what we need to have in place to answer this question. Changes in concavity happen anytime the second derivative changes signs. Here's our sign chart for F double prime from back in part B. We go from concave down to concave up to concave down to concave up. The changes in concavity happen at this x, at this x, and at this x. And then I just made sure that I had my, my reasoning in a verbal statement there. So I basically just concluded with what I just said verbally and rattled off those three x values. Last part of this, uh, they tell us that f of 1 is 3. They want us to write an expression for f of x. It's supposed to involve an integral. And they, they want us to use that to figure out f of 4 and f of negative 2. So this is the rate of change of f, right? This is the derivative of f that we have access to. You've probably done this a lot in application. This is a little weird to do because there's not really any unit analysis or any context to this other than, hey, here's a derivative. You need to know a derivative is a rate of change. If I'm trying to figure out how much change the function has from 1, when I know the function value, right, the function value at 1 is 3, until uh, an unspecified value of x, I need to take the function value I know, I need to add on how much the function value changes by from 1 up until that unknown x by integrating the rate of change of the function. And the rate of change of the function is the first derivative. So this is a lot like if you've ever done the problems where you've had a container, it starts with five gallons of water, water is pumped in at this rate, how much water do you have after 10 minutes of pumping? You always take that starting amount and you add on how much water enters by integrating the rate at which water is entering from the beginning of the time frame until the time that you want to know the water level at. So it's kind of the non-application version of one of those problems that we're tasked with here in part D. Uh, notationally, this is something you'd want to watch out for. The input to the function is x. We need to make sure our input is specified by this limit of integration right here. And therefore, we don't want to list x within the integral at all. So I just picked a dummy letter t. And you've seen this quite a bit if you've done problems with the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. But if we want to go ahead and use this to figure out what f of 4 is, we're going to take 3 and add on the integral from 1 to 4 of the rate of change of f so the derivative of f, and from 1 to 4, that would be the area between the graph and the t-axis, or the x-axis from here to here. Uh, they tell us what that is. They tell us that that's 12 units. Now, the one thing you have to watch out for is that that's a signed area, and this region is definitely below the x-axis, so I'm going to have to take 3, and I'm going to have to subtract 12 off of it, since that's what the definition of a definite integral is. It's a signed area and not just and area. Uh, for number for the second part of part D here, find f of negative 2. Same idea initially. So I'm taking 3, I'm adding on how much the function changes by, by integrating the rate of change of the function, the derivative of the function, from 1 to negative 2. 
if you want to use signed area arguments, you do want your limits of integration to be in the proper numerical order. You want the smaller number at the bottom and the bigger number at the top. So we didn't have that initially when we set this integral up here. So I've flipped them. And to flip the limits of integration, you just have to change the sign of the integral. So flip them, change the sign out here. So I had 3 and then minus whatever the integral from negative 2 to 1 is. Well, from negative 2 to 1, they tell us that that area is 9 square units. So from here to here, we have 9 square units of space. Once again, though, we're below the x-axis or the t-axis, so we're going to have to make sure that we make that negative. So subtracting the negative really makes it addition, and we end up with 12 for that one.